go there. We're going to do a multiple regression example using some of the data sets that are uh, in the original book by Morley. Let's get started. So here we are in Jamovi. And what we're going to do is to load in a data set. We'll do that by typing open and coming down and selecting 6.1 and 6.2 from wherever it is we downloaded on our computer. And here we have our data. So the first thing we're going to do is to do a multiple regression exactly the way they talked about it in the book. And then we're going to go back and do all of the things that a person who graduates from the University of Missouri should do if they're going to be assumption checking the data. Okay, here we have a data set where we have some motivation scores, some GPAs, a measure of verbal ability and hours of studying. And like everybody, we're interested in knowing how to predict GPA. So we're going to come into regression and select linear regression. And our dependent variable is going to be GPA and our predictor variables are going to be motivation score, IQ and hours of study. And if we wait for a little bit, we see, aha, here we have some regression weights. These are unstandardized regression weights and the statistical significance level associated with those. So from this, for example, we can see if we can increase a person's motivation score by a point, we expect to see a gain of 0 0.02301 points gain in GPA. A little hard to know how to interpret these estimates. I mean, some are significant. Hours of study is not significant. If we're interested in looking at those coefficients in terms of their relative magnitude, we can look at the standardized estimates. Oh, now a better picture shows up. We can see that the motivation score seems to have a relatively larger standardized estimate than IQ, and hours of study has a relatively small standardized estimate. I might be interested in the confidence interval of the unstandardized regression weights, and I might be interested in the confidence interval of the standardized regression weights. All right. So looking at this, that's the way that the book would say to do it. Now, to be a little more critical about this, let's go back and take a look at the data and see if we meet the assumptions of a regression model, namely that there are no influential observations and that the functional relationship between the predictor variables and the criterion variables is roughly linear. To do that, let's come back and look at the exploration tab. And we'll first of all, take a look at our descriptive statistics. Let's take a look at all of them. And perhaps I'm interested in knowing the skewness as well. So down here, we see this descriptive statistics. And we see that the motivation score appears to be negatively skewed. That is, it's got a large tail on the left-hand side. Our dependent variable of GPA is negatively skewed, but less so. Our IQ variable is positively skewed. Hmm. Could some of these things not be a linear relationship? Let's come in and take a look. Let's scatter plot the data. Our Y variable is grades, and our X variable might be, well, let's take a look at motivation for the moment. Hmm, what do we see here? Well, it looks like there's a positive association going on. Now we have a couple of people down here on the left-hand side who have motivation scores that are a lot different than the rest of the motivation scores. When we do a regression, we're looking at the linear contribution of that particular predictor variable to the criterion. So we're drawing a straight line through the data. Hmm. Not so great in this way, because high motivation scores actually have scores that are a little bit above their predicted values up here. And these people down here seem to be kind of influential. 
if we look at a smooth line, that picture looks a little bit more dramatic. So here, for example, and say, yeah, I don't really think that in this relatively small data set that there's a linear relationship going on. Probably I need to do something about these two people down here on motivation score on the left-hand side of the sit that are you know, kind of mucking things up and maybe masking the real relationship that's linear and goes through this cloud of points over here. Before we leave here, let's take a look at the rest of these. Let's put IQ on the x-axis. Well, hmm, that's less so. It looks like we have three very high IQ people, but they seem to be kind of sort of on the regression line. So if I look at the smooth value or the straight line value, it's kind of going through the same points here. I have a little bit of a bounce here. It's a small data set. Maybe I don't need to adjust the scores quite so much. Maybe it's this one person who has an IQ score of 100, but is far below the mean, that black person might be an outlier. It's a judgment call. Let's look at hours of study and how it's related to GPA. Well, here kind of looks like there's a straight line going on. The, the smooth line gives a little bump here and there, but generally speaking, I think I'm okay thinking about that as a straight line relationship. Okay, so what I'm gonna to wanna to do is to come back to my motivation thing, scores here, and maybe Windsorize these two points down here who have a motivation score that's relatively low. Well, if we come back up here and look at our regression model, notice they have a standardized regression estimate of 0.55, which to the Morling textbook is a very relatively strong relationship. Would I get a 0.55 if I were to bring those two points up and Windsorize them a little bit and put them closer to uh, the rest of the scores in the distribution? Um, now remember, I'm doing this for some good reasons. If I were to do my study over again, it's probably very unlikely that I'm going to get these two people down here again. Probably I'm going to get more of a picture that's going to look like the, the majority of the data points in the sample. Okay, well, to Windsorize, step one, save your data. This is known as making an audit trail. So I'm going to come in and I will export the data as a comma delimited file and save it. The reason that we're saving our original data is that so if we ever want to go back and make a different decision about how we treated the data, we have access to the, the way the data came in. Now we're going to make another version of our data based on the Windsorize score. So let's export this data set and give it a name, Windsorized at the end, so we can keep track of what we did and save that as a comma delimited file. <laughs> well, let's find these little creatures down here. Let's come over to the exploration and get our descriptive statistics. And we're interested in looking at the motivation scores. And then down here, I want to look at the most extreme outliers. Right now, I find these two scores down here on the lowest value, row number 42 and row number 45 have values of 25 and 30 respectively. And the next lowest score is 50. So to Windsorize relatively informally, I'm going to assign 25 and 30 to values of 49. So let me write that down. That's going to give us row number 42 and row number 45. Coming back to our data, Let's come down to 42 and 45, and there they are. I'm going to give those a value of 49.
And now I'm going to come back and redo my regression. Linear regression. My dependent variable is still GPA, and my predictor variables are these three predictor variables that we had before. And again, we'll come downstairs and say, I want to have a confidence interval, of course, and I want to have the standardized estimates in the confidence intervals. So take a look at what happened. When I Windsorize those two scores, my value changes. So I've got a standardized estimate of 0.64. Before, I had a standardized estimate of 0.63. So not a lot of change. Oh, it comes back and it changes these things on you. Okay. And that basically is all we need to be doing. We can come back and do some of the other tests here and assumption check a little bit. I might want to look at the normality test and I might want to look at the Cook's distance. The Cook's distance is a global test of whether I have somebody in there who's going to be maybe a little bit influential and or outlying. So in terms of Cook's distance, I see I have a maximum of 0.355 here. So what we're seeing here when we look at the Cook's distance is that there's an observation that has a Cook distance of 0.355. Well, who is that person? So what we'll do to find that person is to come down here to the save command and we'll save the Cook's distance. And what we then see in our data is that we have a new variable, our old variables that we had before, and a new variable called Cook's distance. And what we have to do is locate the person who has the 0.355 and think about that person a little bit. How did they come to be either outlying or influential? Well, this person has a 3.2, a value of 105, and a value of 14 and hours of study. Well, 105, if we think about that in terms of the scatter plot, predicting grade point from IQ, is somebody who's right about here. So it could be that that person might influence our study. It's not really obvious if I should Windsorize that person or simply exclude them from the data. I might, for example, come back and select that row and delete that row and rerun my analysis. At which point when I come upstairs, it's going to redo all of my analyses. So now, for example, I have somebody who has a maximum score of 0 0.404. Hmm. Didn't really look like it gained much. If I come back and look at my regression analyses, and rerun my standardized estimates. <clears throat> predicting GPA from motivation hours of study and so forth. I've got kind of sort of the same numbers, except now I have a 0 0.70 standardized estimate. So it increased a bit. So that individual was probably more of an outlier or a little bit more influential. Our R squared went up dramatically. Our standardized estimate is 0 0.7. So that is a demonstration of how you would go about exploring the functional form. Are there, for example, influential observations? 
and Windsorizing and exploring at least a few of analyses in your side analyses that you would normally do in evaluating a true predictor regression model. I hope this helps. Thank you.